Uh, my name's Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today's February 1, 2012, and I'm in Norman, Oklahoma with artist Dorothy Sullivan. Dorothy, you're a Cherokee artist who's worked as a teacher and commercial artist, mm -hmm. evolving a style that can be poetically realistic or decorative by turns, and uh, which always has a place for a certain spirituality. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Seminole, Oklahoma, and uh, I grew up all around in Oklahoma. But How many brothers and sisters did you have? I have one sister. And what did your folks do for a living? Well, my dad was, uh, he started working in the oil fields when he was in the, uh, would have been in the eighth grade. And, and uh, they moved to Seminole, so that's where our family started. But um, then later he worked as an insurance salesman and was pretty much self-educated. So I was pretty proud of him. And your mom was like a homemaker? As she was until I was in high school and then she started working uh, as a sales lady in a department store. And she loved that, so. But my dad was the Cherokee. That's where he, he used to sit in the, in the porch swing, and my sister and I on each side, and he would sing to us and play the harmonica, and then he would tell us about being Cherokee and some of the family history and how we should be proud of being Cherokee. So his, his folks had already passed on but did you um, know his your... mother? His mother passed away when I was uh, six, and she was one of my favorite people when I was little. You still still she have memories. She always lived close to us. What are some of your memories? Uh, she was always had hugs. She was uh, really short. She looked Cherokee, and she uh, she was. Um, fluffy, I guess, <laughs> and she always, uh, I remember her holding me and rocking me and singing to me. And Did she ever sing in the language a little? Or? I don't remember that, if she did or not, but... Good memories. Mm -hmm. um, what is your earliest memory of doing art? Um, I started drawing before I went to, to school. Uh, I remember one of my mother's sisters uh, trying to show my sister and I how to draw something when we were driving somewhere, uh, where we were going. But, um, and I was just fascinated and was able to draw what she did. And then I, I, that's when I started. I was, from then on, I was just what I did. So were any extended, or family members, were any of them artists as well? No, no. <laughs> just me. <laughs> did you have uh, experiences with art in primary or secondary school? Um, no, not really. Um, the first art class I had, I was a senior in high school. And before that, I just really self-taught. But you had you had discovered that you could draw something that sort of looked like what you were I, drawing. I, yeah, uh, it was easier in a lot of ways. I I was so right-brained and left-handed that it was easier for me to draw something than to talk about it or to say something. <laughs> And when you were doing these drawings around the house, did you have plenty of materials? Uh, no, not a lot. I had some, but mm -hmm. just anything I had, I worked with. What were your folks' reaction? They liked, they liked it. They were encouraged, my mother especially encouraged me, so. So you got into high school and you had an art class. Um, mm -hmm. What? What did you learn in that class? That well, uh, the instructor 
was the college art teacher at a central university because our school was, our high school was part of the teacher training program. And so we got to take a few classes and go across the street to the university. So um, I, I did my first piece of sculpture there and uh, with what materials? Clay. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Um, I did my first oil painting, which thrilled, I was thrilled with that. Um, just, I, I liked the class, but it was just, uh, seemed like uh, I didn't, uh, I did, it made good grades, that, but I just didn't like that part. I just liked doing, doing the pieces, but I didn't like the assignments, I guess I'll put it that way. Okay. <laughs> I you... like doing my own. <laughs> what was your least favorite assignment? <laughs> uh, mm. I think a, a craft project. I uh -huh. can't even remember what it was. <laughs> when did you sort of decide that art was something you wanted to explore? I seem like Seriously. I just always knew that that's what I wanted to do. But I grew up in the 50s in southeast Oklahoma and uh, everybody, all the kids expected to get married when they graduated. And uh, my family didn't have money to go to college, for it to send me to college. So I didn't really, I just dreamed about it. I didn't really, <clears throat> you know, plan on it. But uh, then uh, I got married right out of high school and uh, had four little boys. And um, my, it, was, it was kind of a tough time then because we lived in Ada. And the, for the, uh, if you didn't have a, a lot of education, you were you know, 50 cents an hour person. And uh, so my husband worked at a service station for 50 cents an hour, pretty tough times. And so he was in and out as far as the home. And uh, <clears throat> so finally, um, my, my sister graduated from college. She got a scholarship to go and as a teacher so I was <clears throat> she encouraged me to try for that to take care of the boys you know and uh, <clears throat> it was a pretty emotional time because uh, the thought of, of welfare and that kind of thing just horrified me so <laughs> You had to find yeah. something. <clears throat> had you, by the time you were in high school or even just before you, you started to college, had you been exposed to any Native art at that point? Did you see? Not very much. Not very much. Um, I didn't really know, see the, any difference because I didn't, wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was really exposed to that was when <clears throat> I moved to Conowa, Oklahoma after I'd been teaching for a while. And uh, uh, there were a lot of Native American kids in my classes and they were interested in doing their type of art. And so I started one of the first Indian art programs in the state at Kanawha. And the kids had a choice if they wanted to in, be in the Indian program, that was fine if they were Native American. But they, one requirement was, is they had to, to uh, give a report by interviewing at least one elder. They had to learn about their tribe. If they were Creek, they couldn't do teepees. 
Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they had to learn about their tribe and uh, give reports on that as well as their artwork and why they were drawing this and all, you know. And then trying to help them not just copy some of the native art, but to help them develop their own style of that which was a lot of fun. And then I had my, uh, I had a four year planned art program for the, the other part. So I had to work in the things that the native kids needed with their program, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, at the end of that year, there was a art show contest at East Central University and uh, the, both both art groups went and they both won a lot of awards <laughs> so they came back and uh, they really liked the principal so they came back and uh, e- a representative of each group took their awards and dumped them on his desk <laughs> and so we had uh, an art show at the end of the year and the kids had never had one before. And so it was pretty exciting. That's, that's really it. innovative. Just, I want to go back and then come and pick up this topic again. When you went through college to get your teaching degree, what, did you also have a minor in art? Was it with the thought no, of teaching I, art or was it? My major was in art education. Okay. And then I had another major in history because I loved history. Now, at first, I thought I wanted a degree in industrial arts because I loved uh, designing anything, houses, furniture, anything. And so, uh, but I took one drafting class and that was the wrong, I was born in the (laughs) wrong time. I did well, but if I asked one question, I had all these guys over here trying to help me do it. And I thought, okay, we'll go for a different, <laughs> a different uh, major. <laughs> so it was because you were, a new, as a woman, it was unusual yeah, was for told, a woman to be in their classes. I was told uh, by a counselor that I wouldn't be able to get a job teaching industrial arts because I was a woman. Wow. And that was in the 50s, so. Right, right. Uh, Things are different now. Yes, (laughs) fortunately. (laughs) Um, So you got a good foundation as you were taking that art education program. You got more of a foundation than you'd had in high school. I got a very good one. I had two very good instructors at East Central at that time. And they really taught the basics of how to draw, how to see, how to imagine, you know, all these things that I think are important. And uh, I think drawing is the basis of it. And so when I started teaching, that became the basis of my program and to help the kids. And I, uh, I had a poster that I had up in my room that uh, in order to do your art, you need to learn how to see, how to think, and how to feel, and combine all those things into your own expression. So that was, that was the fun of it, was, especially with high school, was uh, trying to, to work with each each kid individually and help them develop their style and not just copy but they uh, they learn the basics first so by the time you ended up at Kanawha and what time period are we talking about um 75 okay 75 76 so there have been a few reforms I graduated in from university in 66. Okay. So. So there's been some reforms in Indian education, but uh, you you have really, you pretty much sold single-handedly 
had decided that you were going to take that approach in your art program? Mm-hmm. When I uh, started that at Kanawha, I, I met with some of the Native parents and uh, um, got all the information that I could find to try to, to make it what it, I thought it should be and tried. So, and then every year I worked on that if I had Native in my class. Um, when I went to Tahlequah, I did the same thing. I had a Native art program. And you said that it sort of implied that the principal was perhaps not crazy about the idea at first, or was he always supportive of that? Um, he okay. was. He Good. was supportive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after you've um, you've been you've started this kind of native art program, are you then also sort of looking ever going to any Indian art shows, or are you continuing to paint on the side and? I painted on the side. Um, where I got interested in doing my own native art, um, I had always just kind of taken it for granted about being Cherokee. But as far as trying to express that, I didn't that much. And uh, my dad was killed in a car accident. Uh, in his 50s mm-hmm. and uh, you know there's two two things that caused me to start one was was uh, thinking of a way to honor him and another is I went to uh, the Trail of Tears art show to, just to view it uh, I'm trying to think what I think it was 1980 in the 80s, and uh, I was so thrilled by all the art and the the artists, and uh, it, I just had a very emotional feeling that this is this is what I need to do. And uh, so, after my children were grown up, and uh, I was able to. Well, I, I retired from teaching and started in uh, 1991, 90, I think. Yeah. Start, first started full-time. Started full-time mm-hmm. in 1990. Yeah. Um, you, ha- you did study under Fred Olds, right, who's a well-known... Uh, no, I really didn't study under him. He okay. was just a mentor. Um, when I was teaching... Um, at a little town called Perkins, uh, teaching art. Because you went from Kanawha to Hennessy and then to Perkins. No, I went to Hennessy, then Kanawha. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll pick that up. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I also was the gifted teacher for the high school. And so I tried to find mentors for some of the kids who were in that program. And so I had one uh, one kid that was a cowboy kid, and he was the neatest kid, and very talented in his artwork. And uh, so I contacted Fred Olds. Didn't know him or anything, but I just, oh well, for the kids, you know. And so, uh, He met, he said, come over and we'll talk. So I did, went to his studio and he said, I told him all about the kid and I was all excited. And he said, all right, now let's see your, your work. So I did. And then that (laughs) summer I ended up going uh, to Guthrie every day and working in a studio over there with him and a couple other artists. So. Was it an official workshop, or were you just... Nope, just just a, a little gallery he had in, a, in studios upstairs, and it was a lot of fun. How oh, neat. So that's when I started really showing uh, with, the, with him, and uh, he had cowboy and Indian artists. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of 
really good friend that I had that was also a mentor was uh, Jerome Bushyhead. And uh, so the, those two are the ones who really said, now you need to go for this, you know. And that was scared to death, but I did. I encouraged you to, to uh -huh. think about doing it full yeah. time. Mm -hmm. In Hennessy, I'm, I'm thinking you probably did not keep up your in an art program. You maybe didn't. No, because have uh, we moved up there and it was a whole different mm -hmm. population there. Right. A lot of them uh, were farmers, you know, wheat farmers. Right and oil field workers. And a lot of the kids were um, German or German type background. So they weren't as interested in that, right. but. <laughs> <laughs> they still got the basics. I moved, I moved, to, uh, moved to Perkins and there were Native Americans there. And then uh, from there I went to Tahlequah and we worked on it, so. So what medium did you start out in, sort of, when you decided, I guess you'd been experimenting in school, but what did you sort of choose to... I liked everything. I liked, I, I liked drawing. I did a lot of pencil drawing, colored pencil. Um, then I mixed it with watercolor. Um, but my favorite forever was oil. But when I got to where I had to hurry and get something finished <laughs> for the shows, because uh, being an artist is a job, it's a lot of work, and uh, sometimes stress trying to get ready for the shows. So I would switch to acrylic so I could get it done faster. <laughs> Wasn't my favorite. <laughs> So, I think I remember seeing you, though, at art shows maybe in the mid-80s. Once you'd had that Trail of Tears experience, did were you visiting more shows and sort of talking to at the late Indian 80s. artists? Uh -huh. Who were some artists you especially admired, especially liked their work? Um, a lot of them. <laughs> you know, I think that um, um, Daughters of the Earth were painting or, you know, around the mid '80s, or you know, so it was the, the Malden sisters and um, Mary Adair and Virginia Stroud. I don't know. Um, if they were. I had I saw some of Virginia's work and I liked it. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, of course, Donald Van liked his work. Um, your husband I liked his work. <laughs> A lot. Um, gosh, there's so many. It's hard to... Did you get any business tips from anybody when you started out? Any From any artists? Um, yes, Jerome was pretty good about telling me, you know, you should do this or that. And it helped. Uh, so was Fred. Um, see, I, Fred Olds? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And uh, before I started the Cherokee art, I did a lot of Western art too, because I loved history, so I put all this together. And uh, That's right. <laughs> so when I started the Cherokee art, then, you know, I had what my dad had told me, but I did a lot of research, not just books, but talking to the elders, to people, to, uh, both in Oklahoma and in North Carolina and Georgia because I would go back there and uh, then I got to where I could have shows at the museum in North Carolina. Uh, tried to go every year mm -hmm. for a while and uh, so you know that helped a lot and then working with the museums as much as I could get out of them, <laughs> worked oh, with them. To go in and you might ask to see, you might ask to see certain artifacts or right, and sketch. Right, and learn as much as I could mm -hmm. about the culture and Which history. Which museums did you? Um, there was two in Cherokee, North Carolina that I really liked. Um, 
there was some in Georgia, and I can't think of the name now. Um, and then I, uh, the Cherokee Heritage Center in Tahlequah um, also did research on my family, Cherokee family. And um, all that was really interesting and, you know, fun. When did you, when you first went to North Carolina, started visiting Eastern Band, Eastern Band mm -hmm. Cherokee people, were you, did you and your husband go together? Was mm -hmm. it something you had planned? How did that, how did that unfold? It must have been pretty Um, I got an invitation to come to Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, show. because they had a, yeah, they had that Indian art show for a couple of years. No, yes. I think it was more than that. Yeah. I went several times. Okay. And then we would go up to the Cherokee Reservation mm -hmm. after and spend a week there. And then I uh, made several friends who were full blood Cherokee uh, that I always look forward to seeing. And, and a lot of them kind of painted. So, oh, they did? Uh, okay. Yeah. So. I really enjoyed going there every year. In terms of your trips to Georgia, which is where your family's, your Cherokee family is from originally, what what are some moments that stand out for you? Well, we found uh, all I had to go on was what my dad had told me about the family coming from there to Oklahoma. And so I was, it's really strange. I had two distant cousins that I'd never heard of before that contacted me and invited me to Marietta, Georgia. By where, phone or? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And later. How did they get a hold of you? They saw they, you? They just saw my work. Uh-huh. And, you know, so, uh, and I went there and got acquainted with both of them. One of them was, uh, he's like a local historian. And uh, so he was a, was a lot of fun. Yeah. He wrote a, a column uh, every week for the local paper and all that. And uh, so he took us up, up on the mountain north of Marietta where my Cherokee family lived. Uh, and then, uh, well, there's there's several generations, but but uh, one of them lived at uh, what used to be called Alatuna Town. It was a Cherokee town before the Trail of Tears, and it's now part of Red Top Mountain State Park. And uh, so we got to go and see where he lived. And uh, his sister and his son actually came on the Trail of Tears from Georgia. But he was killed by the, uh, the, Georgian, the Georgians mm. uh, state. They were south of the Chattahoochee River, south mm. of Atlanta. Mm. And then the Cherokee land was north. And our family lived close to the Chattahoochee on the Cherokee side. So uh, they, before the Trail of Tears, when the gold was discovered and the uh, people were, were wanting to take the Cherokee land for that, they even passed a law that the Cherokee could not mine gold even on their own land. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he was, they, they would send these uh, okay. marauders or whatever people that would come and raid some of the mm -hmm. Cherokee farms and things. And so uh, Young Deer was my ancestor's name. And he was, he went down by a little creek near the town, Cherokee town, to pray every morning. He was a Christian. And so uh, he was, his sister found him there, he'd been shot, mm. and uh, so, you know, that was his wow. story, but yeah. she came on to Tahlequah mm. and lived there, and, uh, but 
uh, young deer's son was called Indian John, and he uh, came on the trail, but he ran away and went back to Georgia and hid up in the mountains north of Marietta and worked as a blacksmith. So we have a lot of fun stories I, I got from them and, and uh, how his sons fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War and all that, so it's kind of fun. How did it, it impact your art, that kind of really direct Encouraged experience? Me. of? Mm -hmm. um, I really, I, I had always been interested in Western history and in Indian, especially that, and then the, the Cherokee, when I actually got to go back there and really, and, and the first time that we drove into the Smoky Mountains, I couldn't keep from the tears, just, it was so emotional and it's hard to explain, but I've heard there are a lot of other mm -hmm. uh, people who, do that when they go back there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was hard to explain, but it was like you were going to your home. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. not hard to say, but. <laughs> so, um, what's an award that you won early in your career that was important to you? Um, the first time I entered, the Trail of Tears art show. Uh, I had no thought of winning, and I won first in the Trail of Tears, and it was a real shock. You want to explain that it. category a bit? The yeah. Trail of Tears uh, category is uh, where you you do a painting that expresses what happened on the on the Trail of Tears, which was a forced. Uh, movement of the tribes to Oklahoma and uh, what was your image? It was um, it was just a, a young Indian girl she has on blue jeans and a, a t-shirt and she's got her thumbs in her pockets and she's acting kind of tough you know and then behind her is the memory circle which became like symbol when you and uh, inside of that is the people on the trail so it's like you know don't forget your heritage you know some of these changes are not that great <laughs> <laughs> you've um, spoken a bit about encountering prejudice sometimes as a Cherokee artist um, because you maybe weren't as identifiable as some other people. Was that from other Indian artists or um, non-Indians or? I really didn't even think about it when I went into it because I felt so strongly that I was supposed to do it. But yes, I did run into some of that. Most of the ones who were verbal about it were white people who came to the shows and they would say, you don't look Indian. And I said, well, I are one. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, some, it's funny, there are some usually full blood people. I never had anyone uh, ever question it. Uh, it would, the, you know, only ones that I really, uh, noticed were um, either white or part white and uh, uh, my dad looked like one but I just happened to not get the darker skin <laughs> but my son, some of my sons are so you know uh, it doesn't bother me one way or the other because I just felt that I had a, a purpose for my painting and that's what I did, so. <laughs> you weren't um, as immersed in the gallery scene as, as long as some people, um, but what changes did you notice, well, I guess around from the 80s, from the 90s, which is 
when you started really being active with galleries, is that right? Um, I did some galleries. I didn't a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, you focused on the one thing. Shows it was more. yeah. I'd rather have gone to the show and sell my work myself because, uh, as you know, the gallery takes quite a chunk out of the out of the money. So that part was kind of hard at first, but uh, as I got older, uh, I decided to work with one or two galleries because it is very expensive to go to the art shows, travel and art uh, show fees and all that. So it works, it balances <laughs> out. Um, and of course, you were having a museum show back east for a while. Um, uh -huh. Are you? Do you think your market is more in Oklahoma or outside of Oklahoma? Or um, it's no, it's all over. Uh, the gallery I work with now, uh, there's collectors from different places. That you know, Oklahoma, yes, but uh, I have. They're all over. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one in Connecticut, uh, several different places. So I don't have... You, your two galleries now, one's in Oklahoma, or are they both in Oklahoma? They're both. Mm -hmm. uh, Tribes Gallery mm -hmm. here in Norman, and then um, the uh, Cherokee uh, gift shop and gallery in Tahlequah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are the only two. But I sell my prints and mm -hmm. cards and things all over. Do you sell from your from a web page too, or from the uh -huh. home? Uh huh. Okay. What's um? What was your first? Quite, we know when your first award happened, but what was your first sale or a sale that just was very exciting to you? Because <laughs> a sale. Well, always... actually, this was. <laughs> This was when I was going to college. Okay. I can tell about that one yeah. because it was, um, I was going to, uh, I went to college at all of it, but one year at East Central and Ada, but one year I went to Southeastern. And uh, so that fall, my boys and I were by ourselves. And so, really needed some money, and uh, we had a little show at the school, at the art school at college, and I sold a painting, <laughs> and I was so thrilled. That was my first real sale, and I went and spent every penny at the grocery store. <laughs> so that was the most important sale, I think. Right, right. Um, well, 1999 was kind of a banner year for you because you were like honored one at Red Earth, is that right? Mm -hmm. Best of show at Red Earth. Um, and here you've only been really painting full time for about nine years when, when this happened. Um, starting with Best of Show, what, what uh, was your image for that and, and what did that award mean to you? Best of, well, I didn't. I didn't win Best of Show at Red Earth. Okay. Or at uh, at the uh, Cherokee Museum show. Okay. And that was my piece for uh, uh, She Speaks for Her Clan, which uh, was about our uh, seven clans of the Cherokee. And the models are all were all real ladies from the clans they represented. And Wilma Mankiller was one of the she models. She represented the Blue Clan, which was one of her grandmother's clans. Mm -hmm. So that was that's become my signature piece. It's been in so many uh, publications and things, uh, including uh, Time Life Books, uh, the Smithsonian. Uh, let's see. There's a. Do they have the original at, at the, the original, Museum? No, it's at the uh, 
Museum of the Cherokee Indian. Okay. In Cherokee, North Carolina. In, in Cherokee. Uh huh. And the uh, Cherokee, Eastern Cherokee, uh, bought the site of what they call the mother city, Kadua. Mm -hmm. It's in the mountains out there close to Cherokee, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are in the process of restoring that mother city mm -hmm. into a museum complex. And they said that that painting's going to go there, so I'm very thrilled about that. that is. Uh, one of my uh, Cherokee friends, Tommy Wildcat, uh, went to Cherokee, North Carolina with us uh, even bef way before they bought that painting. And uh, some of the full blood kids took him to that site. And at that time, it was just a little bit of the mound was there, and it was part of a farmer's field. And so on the way home, he took my husband and I by there, and we had to walk down this little hill across a railroad track and everything, and we got there, and it was a beautiful little valley that was ringed with the Smokies. Very emotional for both of us. And I filmed him for uh, a report for his uh, one of his classes at Northeastern University and he got up on top of the mound and was talking about it and then uh, when I shut the camera off and he came down he had tears just you know he said some way somehow this has to be brought back well they're working on it now so it's very important to a lot of people. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope I get to see it. <laughs> and kind of proves how art and, you know, change, social change kind of interweave. Well, I used to teach a class called uh, uh, Drawing is a Second Language. And, but art, uh, it's the best, and I think, way of communicating that there is because you don't have to have language, you know, and uh, people remember the picture more than they do the words. So uh, I always, I really think that, that art is so important for Native people, or any people, to preserve their heritage and their culture and their their history. Um, you did uh, win an award, I guess, in 99 at Red Earth, I think I read in my research. Yes. And you were honored first then as well. First in drawing. Okay, first in drawing. Was that uh, with the bark drawing, or was that a different? A what drawing? A bark drawing. I think that was no. at the Five Tribes. Music. No, that was at Five Tribes. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get to that. On, on tree bark. Right. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. But in the, the one at Red Earth was a pencil drawing. And it's uh, uh, Praise the Lord in Cherokee. And it's three ladies, three generations, and they're singing hymns in Cherokee. And they posed for me at the museum. I took a lot of pictures of them and then did a pencil drawing. That was it. And honored one, that's a kind of a special award. It's not just for achievement, I it's I could painting. not believe it when they called me and told me that I was to be the honored one that year at Red Earth. But it, they select one artist uh, each year to be and they're all different tribes all across, you know, the United States to be the honored one. And so that was, that was like the Academy Award to me. <laughs> it was wonderful. And then the next year I was named uh, uh, Master Artist at the Five Tribes Museum. So it was just a huge, huge year. <laughs> You've done a couple of uh, one-woman, several one-woman shows, I guess. 
Um, is, is there a different challenge to each? Oh, I mean, a solo show is hard, I think, anyway. But what's the challenge of doing one? <laughs> I, I enjoyed doing them. I had, uh, I had one at, at the Red Earth Museum in Oklahoma City. I've had several in North Carolina at the museums. Um, lots of different places and I at Tulsa had one there so at the art market uh, no Excellent. it was at uh, I believe it was Gilcrease Gil uh -huh. so I, did, did it take you a year did you prepare for a whole year or was it well that was before I was selling <laughs> as much so I had some, and yeah, I worked on quite a while, but uh, now I've sold all my originals, so I really have to work to get something oh, done. Oh, well, we're going to get to look at one, so that will be great. Uh, what would, I know um, your husband George has passed on now, but what was his contribution in terms of, you know, this is sort of a two-person business? It really is. Um, he was a minister, and then he retired uh, because of health. And he was always, uh, from the beginning, very encouraging with my artwork, and helped any way he could. But um, he did the when I decided to try to go full time. We sat down and talked about it, and I said, I'll do the art. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> and so he did all the business part, which is a lot. And he taught, he, found, he taught himself to do all the matting and framing, and he got to where he could cut real fancy mats and all that stuff. <laughs> Thank goodness. And another thing, I had a very difficult time trying to use the mat cutter because I'm left-handed and it's set up for right-handed. Mm -hmm. So after he passed away, I, I finally got up the courage and was tried to use my right hand, which is retarded, but to try to cut, and I finally can do it, but not <laughs> near her as good as he did. And, but the best contribution he did was encouragement, um, just being there when I was working on a painting and, and you know, sometimes he'd just come and sit and watch me paint and it would, it helped and I, that's one thing that I really miss now. And I think uh, artists need uh, a spouse to, to be there and just to help them keep going, you know. And another thing, I think artists are the worst business people in the world. <laughs> so they need that support, you know. Right. So. Um, you were contracted by the National Park Service to, to do a painting of the Trail of Tears that was going to be placed at a dispersal center. Uh -huh. Can you explain what a dispersal center is, and then tell us a little bit about what you did for uh, Well, there were 17, I believe, different detachments that came uh, to Oklahoma for the uh, Cherokees, of Cherokees. And there was anywhere from 500 on in a detachment to 1,500 or so. And uh, when they got here, they had to, there were sites set up, and there were several, but there was uh, two that were the main ones. And uh, one of them was near Stillwell, and the people would go there, the wagon train would come in, and it would be, uh, there would be government contractors or people who were in charge of giving supplies out and they would uh, uh, each family would get one month worth of supplies 
and that would just be like flour, uh, maybe some hog meat or something like that, um, a little bit of coffee, a little bit of sugar, stuff like that. It wasn't a whole lot, and uh, corn, you know, but uh, it, every month they would have to come back. They, they were given this rations for a year. So they'd have to come back every month to get their supply while they were trying to uh, find a home site, uh, put in a, a garden or a, a crop. And so it was a pretty tough time. And, uh, but the National Park Service, uh, they are putting these historical markers up at several of the sites, but the first one that I did was Mrs. Weber's plantation, which uh, was, I think most of the, I mean, the majority went to that one. And uh, it was a, there were several different groups of Cherokees that came to Oklahoma. And the first ones came, they were the old settlers. They came before, uh, the others did and had already settled and set up their own government. And then the second group was the treaty party who were considered traitors by some of the majority that were still in, in the old nation. And then the Trail of Tears group. So uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weber had a plantation set up where the site of Stillwell is now. In fact, their home site was, is now part of the Stillwell Cemetery. So uh, I went out and took a lot of pictures uh, in all directions from the, where the home site was and finally came up with, uh, there's a little hill that's down here in the stream below the site. And I thought, well, if my family had just gotten their rations, a lot of them had to hang around the site because they didn't have anywhere else to go. Some of them had old ragged tents and things like that, but I thought, well, I would want to go down and grab that site by the creek. So that's what I have a family that's mm -hmm. there in there cooking and mm -hmm. setting up their stuff. And then way in the background is Mrs. Weber on her porch. And, Mm -hmm. All these wagon trains coming in, and people standing in line to get their stuff. So uh, this was special to me because my grandmother's Cherokee allotment land was just north of edge of Stillwell and not far from that site. Mm -hmm. So it uh, meant a lot to me mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Right. Are you active with the um, Cherokee Artists Association at all? Or? Um, I haven't been. I would like to be, but it means driving to Tahlequah for the meetings. And uh, when my husband was ill, that was impossible to do. And now it's a little hard to go, but I would like to. Mm -hmm. What do you see as some of the benefits of being in an association, artist association? I think just supporting each other, uh, encouraging each other. That's good. That's another thing that was good about going to the shows was just the, the visiting with the other artists and being able to encourage each other and share. And the interaction mm -hmm. gets kind of lonely sometimes, doesn't mm -hmm. it? How is your um, how has your palette, your color palette, changed over the years? I know it depends on whether you're working in acrylics or oils, but well, I pretty well just use a basic palette. Uh, just do you think it's gotten lighter or darker or worse? No, it just depends on what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you like to draw, and I know that, um, do you do a lot of preliminary studies before you do a painting? Not a lot, but I usually 
I used to do not as much anymore, mm -hmm. but uh, detail pencil drawing before I would do the painting. I see. But then, uh, and then sort of paint directly gone. on the once you've done your drawing, sort of paint directly on the board or can canvas. Uh, yeah, I usually uh, transfer an outline of the drawing. Okay. But not the, not the drawing itself, and then I. But I, what I reason I do the drawing is first of all is the composition and design, and then the second thing that I think is important is uh, the uh, shading, the lights, and light and dark, determining where the lights come from and all that. So I think it's important to get those two things before you start putting the paint on there. <laughs> right. Do you use um? Do you um, when you're working with acrylic, are you working on canvas or board or both? Both. Mm -hmm. And how often do you do oils anymore? Is that? Um, it depends on uh, what I'm working on. Uh, if I have something I have to finish in a hurry, I use acrylic. Um, and I've started doing a lot of uh, dancing turtles for fun. And so when I need to get one of those done, they're <laughs> usually in a hurry <laughs> and for fun. Mm -hmm. And so those are acrylic or watercolor. So, Family interactions are a strong thread of your work. Um, what do you try to convey with those images? Well... I just really think that family is very, very important. I have five sons and they've been my life. And I have a large extended family from them. So I think that family is very important. Uh, love of family, support of family. And uh, so I, I try to show that. And uh, another thing that I've, I've painted a lot of women, strong women, and uh, I think that was a part of the Cherokee and a lot of other Native people, the respect and love for their women, as well as the depending on the strength of their women. And so that's something I'm kind of proud of. So that's what I was trying to show with that. You do use live models and you take photographs, but do you also do, will you also do like on-site kind of studies? Um, have somebody just stand there sit and or stand? Uh -huh. uh, sometimes, but not as often because it's so hard to get people to do that. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I can grab some a family member, too, to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's sometimes it's easier to work from. But I don't just copy a photograph. I a lot of times I will take two or three or more, and work from that to do the person. So mm -hmm. it's not just a copy of a photograph. Is the same true with your uh, when you're doing a landscape? Are you sort of working straight from the photograph as much as you can, or are you always? Well, if I can, I'd rather work from the mm -hmm. regular place. Um, on this painting we were talking about a while ago, Mrs. Weber's plantation, I took a lot of painting, a lot of pictures, a lot of different ways, and sought of the site. Mm -hmm. And then I worked from that, but uh, there really wasn't any way just to sit up and, and paint there. Uh, so right. I did most of that from and remembering the site. Right. You know, a lot of it is in your head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, You've sort of talked about the res kinds of research that you do for your paintings. How important is humor in your work? Oh, I, I think it's important. 
uh, I think emotion is very important. Uh, trying to portray a feeling or an emotion, um, that's part of the communication of the art. And uh, whether it's uh, humor or something else, but uh, I like to try to show strength, uh, love, um, some humor, and especially with the turtles. Right. <laughs> uh, the dancing turtles, because uh, the way that came about, the dancing turtles, would you like? To yes, I'd like to hear that story. Well, my husband had been sick for quite a while, and it was kind of a tough time. And uh, one summer, he was sick, my sister had a stroke, and my mom almost passed away, and my grandson wrecked a car. So there was a lot of things. We even had a storm that blew our fence down. So mm -hmm. a lot of stuff and, uh, to deal with. And so I was in my studio one day trying to get myself to where I could work, you know, and concentrate and kind of having a pity party. And I'd collect little miniature turtles have for a long time just because I think they're fun. And uh, so all of a sudden in my mind, I have my imagination works over time sometimes, but uh, all of a sudden I was dancing around the room with my turtles. <laughs> and I just felt made me feel good and it made me smile. And so I did a painting of three turtles dancing. And uh, I, because I needed a piece to donate to the OU, uh, it was the arts department. They were having like a fundraising, fundraising. thing. And so I, that's what I did it for. <laughs> and then from then on, I've had people wanting tur dancing <laughs> turtles. And so it's been a lot of fun to uh, think of different ways to show dancing turtles because, you know, right. <laughs> why are they dancing? <laughs> Including my granddaughter, <laughs> which you so nicely gave her. Um, when you look back at your career, what do you think was that sort of fork in the road moment where you know you could have gone one way, but you choose to go another? In the, you mean to be an artist? To be an artist, yeah. Well, I think I've always, always felt like I, that's what I needed to do, but uh, to go full time as a full time artist that was scary because I had depended on income as a teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, the art business is tough. It's hard work, and uh, uh, it's a gamble of whether you're going to sell or not. And uh, so, uh, one thing that had happened was I moved from Tahlequah to Oklahoma City because I was working so many long hours at Tahlequah because I was not only the art teacher, photography teacher, humanities teacher, but I also had uh, was in charge of the news for all the schools, all kinds of things. I was working all the time. So I decided that I was wearing out and mm -hmm. I was offered a job in Oklahoma City. And uh, so I, it was supposed to be in the elementary, the upper elementary, and no sponsorships or anything, just, you know. and. So when I got there and reported for work, it was in a huge junior high that was horrible. And so I had 30 to 35 students in a class at a time, and it was just a disaster. So finally, and, and I finally got ill from, mm. from it. So uh, it was a 
that was my yeah I, it's like I had to have a real hit on the head to realize <laughs> what I needed to do because I had a lot of uh, friends who were encouraging me to go ahead and go full time but I was just scared to do it mm. and my husband at that time had retired from his job so uh, we sat down and talked about it and uh decided you know what he was going to do what i was going to do and we went for it and so made a plan mm -hmm. um you brought up your your memory circles a little bit and i think we're going to get to see one or two and a couple of images here but i wonder if you can just talk about how you sort of how that device came to you well a lot of my paintings have come from uh, when i just wake up in the morning I see an image, a picture, finished in my mind. It's like a color slide. And so in those, a lot of those, especially the Trail of Tears pieces and some of the uh, Cherokee culture pieces and things, I would see those. And to me, it would mean uh, all the wonderful things we've inherited from the past, what we're doing with now, and our hope for the future. So that's what those mean to me. You sort of described part of your creative process. Um, what else is involved? Do you keep a little notebook of ideas? Do you? They're here. Uh huh. Sometimes they stack up too deep. <laughs> Sometimes there will be one or two that will be very uh, emotional to me. And uh, that one keeps bugging me until I have to do it. You know? <laughs> and I don't like to do commission work because I have too many of the others that I'm wanting to do. But Sometimes the money helps. So right, I right. Do. <laughs> um, do you, are you a daytime painter, or do you prefer working at night? Or? I used to work all hours. I used to work all night sometimes, but uh, now I don't. My best time to work is early in the morning till about 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. What has been um, one of the high points in your career? Boy, that's, I don't know. We've already talked about some. Um, I, the achievements are good, but I think, I think the most important thing to me is just um, being able to feel like that that I'm doing what I need to do uh, and it's nice to be recognized for doing that but it's not the most important thing it's it's the it's doing the art that's important so I think that's the best part is just being able to do it how about a low point in your career? When my husband passed away, because, uh, you know, uh, nobody really understands that, going through that, um, until they go through it. But uh, it's like half of you is gone, and, and he was my he was at really half of, of the job of, mm -hmm. I mean, because art, your art is, is a, it's work and it, it's a, so that part was gone and then trying to figure out who you are again. And uh, even if, if I wasn't sure I could even do the work, it wasn't sure I wanted to. And that was why, uh, it was such a blessing to get. Uh, I think God took care of me because uh, 
I got the commission from the National Park Service and all of the encouragement from that. Uh, I got several uh, things of recognition that helped. I got uh, Cher the Cherokee Nation was very encouraging on a lot of things. So it was, it was like every time I sat down and said, I quit, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, it was just like, no, you're not through. <laughs> you have other things to do, you know, get with it. So uh, that, I think, was uh, good. It was not time for me to quit yet. So, Is there anything else you'd like to talk about or anything you've forgotten to mention before we look at your work? I can't think of anything. I think we covered it pretty good. <laughs> All right, great. We'll just take a look at some of these uh, paintings and reproductions. Okay, would you like to tell us about this piece? This is called War and Peace, but it's also Man and Woman. And uh, this is uh, trying to... My art has sometimes been described as spiritual abstraction. So this shows, it illustrates some of that. Um, this is the memory circle. This divides, this side is male. To the Cherokee, the man is the moon and the winter. Uh, the falcon is the war bird. This is the, still the symbol for the Cherokee veterans and the seven feathers for the seven clans. Man went to war in the winter. This side, is woman. The eagle is the peace bird or the messenger. Woman is summer in the sun. She brings life and the harvest is in the summer. So that kind of, this is the rattlesnake design. This is the peace design. All right, this, this painting, this is a poster of Mrs. Weber's plantation. And this is the one that we discussed that was the first painting that I did for the National Park Service. And this shows a family that have gotten their supplies and they're sitting down here by the creek preparing a meal. So this kind of shows you this is the first one. Right. This is a print of a painting I did for the Trail of Tears and it's called But This Is My Home. And the actual site is in uh, Georgia, where my ancestor lived. It's got the red clay of Georgia. This is the background that they would have seen out their cabin, the Smokies. And we got to see that, uh, go to the uh, New Echota and found that their cabin was 16 foot by 16 foot and got the description. So I tried to show that. I even put the newspaper here, Cherokee paper, on this porch. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice these are the soldiers, shadows of the soldiers that are mm -hmm. coming to take them away from their home. And mm -hmm. they're saying, but this is my home. I'm going to try to, yeah, focus in on the shadows. Wow. And the Georgia Trail of Tears Association and the National Park Service used this image on some of their historical markers there in Georgia. And that was thrilling to me because that's where my family came from right. originally. All right, this painting is Gifts of Our Ancestors, 14 Generations. And this is a painting about my Cherokee family and 14 generations of them. It was, uh, it's based on family history and also on a dream that my eldest son right here, James, had about this. He described what, ha what was going on in the dream. There were seven men around the fire and the, there were five women in the background then in his dream. And uh, there was a medicine man that stood behind this old man sang a song in Cherokee, and then he gave him a gift, which was a deer hide. And then he stood behind this man, 
sang a song, and he gave him a red arrow, and so on. And each gift, uh, my son had never studied the costumes, the history, or anything. So it was quite a, a event for us. Wow. But uh, anyway, uh, the gifts, after we got through all this, we realized that the gifts represented what went on in their lifetime. The Cherokee were slaughtering the deer to trade to the whites. In, in uh, his lifetime, his, he gave him the Red Arrow because he lived during the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. Uh, his gift to young deer in Georgia was the turtle rattle, and that was during the forced civilization policy of the government, and it says, hang on to the culture. See, he's got it right here. Mm -hmm. Then young deer gives his son, Indian John, the talking stick. The man who is speaking in the council holds the stick. When he's finished, he gives it to the next one. He lived in Georgia. He was killed by the uh, vigilantes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he came to Oklahoma. This, uh, his gift to uh, my father, who is right here, who was born in Stillwell, uh, he gave him a little gold ring with a hole in it. And we couldn't figure out what in the world. But during his lifetime, my great-grandmother's lifetime, his daughter, my grandmother, my dad, uh, they worked really, really hard to try to hang on to what little they had and it always had a hole in it. Mm -hmm. And also, the gold that was discovered in Georgia uh, during their lifetime, uh, it wasn't really that good. It always had a hole in it. Mm -hmm. So that we thought that was pretty good. And then my dad's gift to James was a little black book. And we didn't know for sure what it was. He thought it might be a Bible. And we went to... A couple of years after I did a sketch for James, because he said, Mom, you've got to do this. So I did a sketch for him, and I didn't think any more about it, but we went to the Jacobson House in Norman to hear Chad Smith and one of our tribal elders, Hastings Shea, uh, give a talk. So Hastings was telling some of the old stories and things. He talked about... Uh, I don't know, a bunch of stuff. But then one other thing that he said was, the Cherokees believe life goes in cycles of 14 generations. The 14th is now. And what we do to prepare that 14th to start it all over again depends, that depends on whether it will be good or bad, what we do to prepare it. So we went like, whoa, that's what that was about. And so uh, the woman on the far end is James's daughter, my granddaughter, and her daughter. And uh, her daughter is the seventh woman in the picture, and she's also the 14th generation, which we thought was really interesting. So... Um, my dad was uh, real involved in his church, and so was he. So we thought, well, the Bible does make sense after all. So that's what the painting, this is the blue timeline and the memory circle showing the gifts, mm -hmm. except right here, young deer giving Indian John the gift. Well, that is a wonderful painting and a wonderful story. And Thank you for sharing that. Thank you.